or good morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Gregory Youngblood with Natomi, and we are here to talk about hypergrowth. And today we've got a really interesting guest. Oleg Krasnov is the head of support excellence at um, at the company called Miro. And I, sorry, guys, I just realized my video was off. There I am. So Oleg works for Miro, uh, a company that I'll let him describe in a second in, in his own words, but he is the head of the support excellence team. And he's here to talk to us today. And Oleg does um, a lot of advocacy for customer service out in the, uh, in the industry. He's, um, he's been an, really an evangelist for outstanding customer relations and using his skills that he learned at over 13 years in the tech industry at companies like Microsoft. And he's also been an advisor to uh, many small companies, one of whom happens to be one of our customers. And uh, he advises them on CX strategy. And, and finally, he, in addition to all his day jobs, he helped develop what was called the Geek Brains curriculum for training around being a customer service leader. So this is this is a person that really um, is into the craft of customer experience. So Oleg, uh, welcome to you. I'm really glad that you agreed to come on and talk to me. Thank you for having me. Okay, and you're uh, you're 13 hours ahead, so it's it's quite late for Oleg right now. Yeah, it's so, uh, 10, 10 p.m. for me. Yeah, okay, so we won't keep you too long, Oleg. But I did put this graph up, uh, graphic up. I told you that I would. Um, this is right off of the Miro website. So I wonder if in just about 20 seconds you could just describe what Miro does, just so our, our, our listeners sure. know. Yeah, so uh, in a simple words, it's an uh, online whiteboard. And basically on this online whiteboard, you can do anything. So uh, I perceive it personally as sort of Lego. Uh, so you can do it for workshops, you can do it for uh, team syncs, you can do it for planning. So basically you just hop on uh, our website, mirror.com and try yourself because uh, it's a free product and we have plenty of use case, plenty of templates. So hopefully is, this will be uh, beneficial for your work as well. Thank you for that introduction, Oleg. Um, let's move immediately into the meat of the content here, because uh, that's why people came. So I wanted to make it very clear for the audience. These are the three plus maybe one, but most most likely these are the three topics that we're going to talk about. Um, uh, Oleg's going to talk about his experience building this, this new concept, at least it was new for me, around support excellence, which we'll describe that is. Uh, we're going to talk about the hyper growth that Miro went through and how they handled that. And then really the value of collaboration. And I know that's that can be a little bit Captain Obvious, um, but let's talk about the, the value of the type of collaborations that Oleg initiates in his company. And, and maybe there's some things in there that you're not already doing. So these are the this is what we're going on uh, during our webinar here. If you've got any questions, I'm, I've got the Q&A uh, bubble up. So at the end, we will address any questions you have, and I'll try to do them as I go along as, as much as I can, otherwise we'll take a break. Okay, so let me stop sharing slides because we don't, we don't want to do slides. We want to do you and I talking here. So let me just redo my windows here so I'm organized. Okay, thanks for your patience, everybody. So Oleg, um, really, I am excited about this, this notion of customer or support excellence rather. So for the audience, I'll, let me just talk a little bit and set this up. So my background is in product management and product marketing and go to market. But for over 10 years, I was in pure product management. And it was always the job of the product managers to prep the, the, the support team, you know, along with the sales team and along with the marketing team. And uh, in some companies that were bigger, we had product marketing, but I'm, I'm gonna give the floor to you, but what you've got to me, your support excellence is the equivalent of sales enablement that I'm used to, where there's a specific team that is tasked with prepping, not the sales team in this case, but the customer support team in this case. And I've never, I've never seen that in a, in a support analogy. I've always seen it in the sales uh, context. So let me just give you the floor and talk a little bit about your organization and what it does, maybe quickly the structure as, as you and I discussed earlier, who's on the team. Sure. So um, 
in a nutshell, support excellence is a sort of support for support. So <laughs> imagine the delivery team, which is the customer support agents who are actually helping the customers. And imagine the work that is sort of done behind the scenes. So for instance, you need to set up your ticketing system or you need to uh, define your training system, or maybe you need to build the onboarding or you need to have someone who will uh, take care of the help center uh, and these kind of things. So, and we are in charge of all non-customer facing work for the customer support at Mira. And, uh, You've mentioned that uh, back in the day when you were the product manager, you was responsible for enabling the team. And I, I would say I partially agree with that because uh, what I personally would expect from the product manager is explanation and documentation of like how the product works. What is the business logic behind this? Maybe from the engineering standpoint, I would expect some tech documentation like, okay, how I can read the logs or uh, how this whole thing works in the admin panel or uh, under the hood, these kind of things. Uh, but when we're talking about the uh, enablement of the support team, you can have, uh, first of all, you need to have people who would arrange all of those processes because sometimes you need to go to those people and ask for this documentation or for this enablement or agree on some specific process that will be in place. And another thing here is that, like, let's say the product enablement is just only one piece here. Another thing is non-product enablement. For instance, uh, how you can uh, define the voice and tone guide or like how you can define the process for the phone support. What would be the difference between chat support and email support and uh, how people can excel in their levels, how to design the uh, roles uh, and the levels and grades within the team so uh, people understand how they can progress further. And uh, another thing is uh, not only about like enabling people, but also a big part of our work is operations. And by operations, I mean uh, systems, tools, uh, cross-functional collaboration, uh, data and analytics, and these kind of things. Because uh, the nature of the work that you can have as a, a support enablement, for instance, when designing the training program for people who just joined the company for people who are, let's say, already been in the company for a couple of years uh, and setting up Zendesk, uh, defining the roles, defining the rules, defining the routing, defining what kind of tech stack behind will be. It's completely different type of job. But uh, ultimately, my team is handling all of uh, these things. So the core team, the delivery team can focus on the main thing, making our customers happy. So how do you make sure that your team's work is in alignment with, you know, the larger context or the larger intent about what, say, the product team is wanting to launch and we work? Are you, I would imagine you guys were full-fledged members of the go-to-market team uh, when you do new launches or new products that come out. So for the launches, uh, the product marketing team is handling uh, this at, at least at Mirror. So uh, product marketing team is... Uh, responsible for making sure that go-to-market teams, they uh, know what is all about, they know how to communicate this, they know uh, what would be the differentiation between uh, our features and the competitors, let's say. Uh, but another thing is, uh, for instance, for support, because we're not like talking about the closing the deals or maybe uh, getting deeper in the business context, like for instance, customer success managers. Uh, we are more about being a product uh, expert. And so for us, it's more relevant, for instance, being in the loop even earlier uh, when we, let's say, have some prototypes, some mockups, or maybe some uh, beta tests, this kind of thing. So uh, it, I would say it's heavily dependent on, uh, on the function, uh, but my team uh, is responsible for handling this over the support. And we just need to make sure that uh, we equip the support team with all the knowledge uh, possible before actual release. So as soon as the feature or some functionality is released, we yeah. understand how to support this. Yeah. So you guys sit within the sales organization, correct? Does that, I think I recall that's what you told me. Not really. Not really. Yeah. So uh, we, <laughs> that's not we everybody have... thinks naturally. So it's, I yeah. love that you say that, but please go ahead. Like, tell me, sure. tell me the justification within Miro for that. 
Yeah, so basically we have um, uh, like three parts of the organization, like three big pieces. Uh, first one is uh, go to market. Uh, obviously, the guys who are talking to uh, the customers or potential customers or the users. Um, we have uh, EPD, engineering product design, who are actually thinking about uh, what kind of product we will have and how we are going to, to build it and to ship it and these kind of things. And the rest would be called sort of operations. So they are uh, out of those previous groups, uh, but they are still necessary for the company. So usually they call like GNA, for instance, like uh, people team, uh, finance, uh, and these kind of guys uh, with whom we can actually, you know, uh, take care of all the, all the previous functions. And so go to, go to market is divided by two organizations, is marketing and revenue. And uh, revenue organizations, uh, an organization includes the sales team uh, in all kinds of matters like SDRs, account executives, account managers, and different segments and these kind of things. Uh, we have the customer experience uh, and we as a support team sit under the customer experience. And customer experience means support, success, uh customer education and current renewals yeah also so, back in the day we had online community yeah so let's let's i mean i want to pause on that point you made so you know i think everybody on the call you know we all know the term customer experience we're all striving for the best customer experience for for our customers so you've got customer support customer success and support excellence all within that cx organization so you've centralized it within miro is what i'm hearing Yes, uh, but yeah. uh, as like from the org structure perspective, as a support excellence, we're reporting to the head of support mm -hmm. and uh, he's reporting to the head of uh, CX, yeah. head of CX reporting head for the sales. head of revenue. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Got you. Okay. All right. So how do you, how do you draw the line between the product management, product marketing types and what you do? Is it, do you find it's a relationship where you're, you're trying to throw more things onto them or that you're actually trying to get bigger scope yourself? And, you know, how, how does that interplay work? Because I think if our listeners here are thinking about setting something like up this up, you know, you've got to really, I imagine there's got to be a real negotiation with product management and product marketing. Right. Like, where's the cut line? What are you responsible for? What are we? So can you maybe talk to us about the, the how you guys have navigated sure. the art of that? So uh, I would say that, the best way to describe this would be just to zoom out and think about uh, what kind of core functions you have and what kind of uh, functions you have that support the core functions. And uh, like if you imagine the kind of small company uh, and let's Im imagine the support team about like five to 10 people, then usually the team lead or the head of support uh, will be directly managing the customer support reps, maybe a few technical support engineers for the second line. Uh, and this person will handle like everything. It, this person will handle hiring, onboarding, setting up Zendesk, uh, negotiation with uh, other functions and these kind of things. And this is fine. This is completely fine when you're a small company. And this is something that happens across all core functions. So this would be true for sales, for the product managers, uh, et cetera. But when you start scaling and when you add more management levels, and also, for instance, you start being distributed, uh, imagine that you have, uh, I don't know, 10 offices across the globe, and now you are suddenly 600 people team. And uh, you have several team leads reporting into the head of support, and the same can be for the sales, for the product managers, et cetera. And the problem that appears in any function is actually the operational burden uh, that is different apart from the uh, people management process. Because as soon as you have more people management in place, as soon as you have more uh, management levels, uh, those people, they are really responsible in uh, hiring best caliber people, onboarding them, uh, making sure they set up for success, uh, make, making sure that they can uh, um, control their performance and these kind of things. And also you need to collaborate within the group because now it's way more complicated. One thing is when you're ultimate decision maker and another thing when you have the leadership group, let's say like for six team leads and you need to somehow to balance those and also manage these team leads. So the task goes com more complex and this is something that goes, uh, you know, uh, tougher and tougher as soon as you uh, get bigger and bigger. And so the usual response uh, from the business uh, in these kind of circumstances is when you can see these operations teams. 
And basically, uh, operations is all about how you can help these core functions to uh, be successful. And uh, in uh, growing companies, you can see all sorts of operations. You can see product operations, support operations, marketing operations, sales operations, any types of operations. And also you can see some specific flavors of operations as we mentioned enablement, because they're also responsible for, let's say for the support for non-customer facing work, but the focus will be uh, specifically for the training mm -hmm. for product enablement, no product enablement, uh, these kind of things. And so uh, talking about the responsibilities, for instance, I closely co cooperate with the, the product operations function. And one thing is when I'm attached to the support team and uh, making sure that support is set for success. Another thing is when the product operations uh, team is responsible for making life of the product managers easier. But obviously we have some uh, mutual uh, agreements and mutual interests. For instance, yeah. I, I can bring the topic about, okay, I want the support team to be included in this product development cycle. Yes. How I can make sure that we can deliver this feedback, how I can make sure that we uh, yeah. are aware, aware of all of those news, this kind of thing. Yeah. But the yeah. product operations manager uh, will be responsible about like, okay, how to design the overall product development life cycle in the product right. organization. Right. So yeah, yeah. so I, I love this and um, just bouncing off my own experience. What I found is when the product managers and the support team are in the same place, it's much more, so I find it to be much more successful. Um, I was with a, a big company in the real estate technology industry and we got bought by our larger competitor, one that everybody knows the name of. And, you know, we used to have everybody in San Francisco. And then after the, after the merger, the support was now, was now out in Denver and away from the product people. And it got a lot harder to design those overall end-to-end -end flows. But I think this is the fascinating work that, a, that, a, that a, a team like yours helps. And I think, that, you know, now if I'm just pointing my, my comments to the, to the audience here, you know, what we're talking about is just like you guys have a sales enablement team is now having a support excellence team and really having them be part of that, that core team that launches products and brings them to market. And in a lot of companies, product managers are tasked with working with just the manager of, of customer success to do these things. And, um, you know, what Oleg here is, is advocating, at least within his own company, is let's have a separate team that becomes real experts on taking a like a product or a selling strategy intent and turning that into customer support flows because it really does matter um, what the what the revenue intent is in terms of the processes that get set up. So uh, Oleg, I love that. Is is there, I was going to move on to more of the hyper growth and how, how support excellence helped you guys navigate that, but anything else on support excellence that you think this audience needs to know to, to uh, kind of get the concept? Um. I think I can uh, quickly dive deep in terms of the like why it's support excellence, not support operations, and what's the difference mm -hmm. between the pillars. Uh, but yes. uh, if if we have time, if if you believe that we we can afford this, uh, then I will. Uh, how about how it. about I'll put you on the spot and say uh, describe it in one minute. Uh, okay. Yeah. Let's let's give it a try. <laughs> so uh, basically, we have three pillars: uh, operations, enablement, and content. Operations is responsible for uh, processes, tools, data analytics, and cross-functional collaboration. Uh, enablement responsible for uh, training, learning, and development, uh, product enablement, uh, non-product enablement, uh, and these kind of things. Content is responsible for both internal and external uh, content. So we are managing both help center and internal uh, systems like Confluence and Guru. So you can imagine enablement as a person responsible for designing the learning experience, let's say choosing the books uh, yeah. and content will be responsible for uh, what would be inside of those books. So, awesome. and just because of the fact that we are not only operations, not only about like the tech stuff, like what's under the hood, that's why we uh, define the term of support excellence rather than one specific thing. That, that was very helpful, okay. I'm going to move us on to hypergrowth because we pitched that as part of the title. Sure. And um, you guys, I mean, hypergrowth, wow, you guys really went through it because you told me before COVID you had 240 employees and then after COVID, not after because we're not after, but like, you know, more of the present day, you've got, is it the thousand employees? Is that what I? 
yeah, recently, just I think a couple of weeks ago, we hit 1,000 employees. Yeah, and that's not just overspending and spending all the all the private equity money or VC. You guys are actually hiring because you like you have the business that's scaling to to really yeah. justify this level of hiring. So, as a reflection of that, what you told me is you were getting, you know, right before COVID hit, two thousand tickets per month, you know, ballpark, and then really right after that had gone up over four x. I mean, you're getting two thousand tickets a week, and it's probably even more now. I'm imagining. Um, so how did Support Excellence help you guys through that? I mean, can you just tell us there's some, some war stories that would be helpful for the audience to understand where, where it really proved its value? So back in the day when we uh, we've seen the COVID surge, we actually didn't have the Support Excellence team. We were just setting this up. And unfortunately, we were forced to have all hands on deck. And we just uh, froze the uh, uh, transitions that we have uh, we had for uh, for the people because we were doing the internal promotions to those roles, and so people were waiting actually for about a year to get started. Uh, and I really appreciate the, their patience. Um, so, in a nutshell, I wish I had the support excellence team back in the day when we had this uh, uh, COVID surge and uh, even even earlier. Uh, but the nature of the moves that uh, we did uh, after the pandemic hit was purely the support excellence related. Because first of all, we like as soon as we we've seen such such a massive growth, uh, and at some point we were having I think around fourteen uh, thousands um, of tickets you know, in a given month. Um, and uh, one of the first things that we did, we just because of the fact that we have uh, different tiers of the users, we were uh, forced to uh, limit the support for the free users. And this is something that was I was thinking about, you know, for quite a long time before uh, the COVID hit. And just in a matter of I think one month, uh, we decided to, you know, for for this uh, kind of bold move uh, and I, I I was just you know scared a bit uh, because of the freemium model I was thinking like okay am I going to ruin the uh, all the virality and all the bottom-up adoption of the product because of that yeah, yeah uh, exactly single-handedly <laughs> yeah yeah uh, apparently uh, I didn't uh, and eventually we just limited support for let's say we uh, were forced to uh, kill it from the main website uh, we limited it within the product uh, for the yeah. free users, and th this helped a lot. But yeah. what what was also yeah, I was going to say what I imagine is that your team was instrumental in identifying the ways that you could put more information on the web or in a Q and A or anything like that. Sure. Um, so I'm I'm imagining this is one of the first places where you proved your value by enabling the the non support option to at least be functional. So that all these free yes. users can, yeah. Can yeah. you can and you point to anything like one of your first successes in that regard that you can that you can point to that maybe wouldn't have happened as quickly without it? Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, before, like I think two months before the COVID, we launched the online community, and this was the place where those free users could go after we limit the uh, human support for them, and mm -hmm. uh, luckily we. Uh, already gathered some champions there. So they were uh, a huge help for us to answer all of those questions. But also in natural organic way, people were uh, helping each other on these forums. Uh, yeah. And this was uh, a huge help for us because I imagine we would have uh, a lot of hate if we just you know didn't yeah. have it but yeah. luckily we, we had like well well organized uh, platform to make it happen another thing that uh, was helping for sort of self service is the help of our customer education team and uh, they're in charge of uh, our webinars and before covid uh, they initially were built as uh, an arm for the customer success team so the goal was to help scale uh, the success organization first of all um, and uh, this why uh, this is why they were connected more mostly for to the enterprise users. And after we've seen such a short surge, we uh, agreed that they will handle weekly webinars, and they they still doing this. And uh, yeah. as far as uh, I, I know, they have around seven nine hundred uh, people attending every week, and yeah. and they they're actually. 
uh, unpacking very basic questions about yeah. the functionality of the product. So you can imagine yeah. like how many tickets were actually deflected by by doing this. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to just comment on that, Owen, for a second. I want, to, I want the audience to absorb that. So what we're talking about here is, is, is Miro went through, you know, hyper growth, as we've been talking about. And you guys were forced into a situation where you, you just, you, there was no way you could give free support to everybody. Yeah. So you had to make a really hard business decision to eliminate that support, or at least the live support for free customers, which for you, the risk was really screwing up the freemium model or the freemium flywheel, yeah. as it's often called. Yeah. And then you'd be the big bad guy, <laughs> you know, if you guys didn't do it right. And so what I'm hearing is that you, the support excellence team was able to really jump in and be part of that and put a lot more focus on how do we gear up for automatic service, for self-service. And um, and we're big believers in that, you know, Natomi, we, we create software that creates self-service through the AI bot. But it's not the only way to do it. The other, the other way is what you're doing is anticipating problems and then putting in solutions. And so one of the things that your team and the customer success team together did was, was create these webinars, which really took care of, I don't know which percentage you said, but I remember you told me a very high percentage of questions yeah. got answered in the webinar. And you had eight or 900 people a week on the webinar, or uh, maybe it wasn't per week, but it was per session that uh, you did. So, you know, I think... Uh, the, oh, like the reason I'm sort of repeating all this is I want to highlight, like, I've been through several in my career, I've been through several big changes about how we do support. I've even, I've even gone through one just like you did, where we decided we couldn't do pre-support. And the, it's always so fraught with peril. And it usually happened through the, the talent of the product managers and then the management of the customer support team. You know, they got together and they did it. But both of those, that was, they were kind of doing it part-time because they had their day job of, of you know, the product managers creating products and, and the customer support of doing their just daily job. So I find is, you know, if you have the luxury, if a company has the luxury to break off this support excellence team, um, it really helps keep the kind of the constant focus on it so things don't drop. And, you know, you can, you can not drop things through the talent and, and of your people, but... I love this, like, this is our job, we're on point, and we have we have a lot of focus on this. So I think this is the value that we're conveying to our audience here is like, yeah, it is a luxury in terms of headcount in some ways, but if you're going through hyper growth, uh, you're gonna need something like this because you're gonna be able to need to, to root cause, you know, the causes of a lot of support problems and then quickly act on those. So I'll pause there, anything to add to that, Oleg? I would say that, uh... Like from the support perspective, uh, you can imagine that we are just in the middle of ev almost every process in the company. And imagine when uh, your company grows, the complexity of the processes uh, grows and you need someone to actually handle this because otherwise you would you know, uh, move too, too slow. And uh, I've, I've, I've been mentioning these webinars and those webinars uh, weren't done by the customer success, but they are uh, done by a standalone team, which is called customer education. And I think this is also sort of like an answer for uh, for the hyper growth because uh, we, we also closely collaborate with those because we're trying to, you know, share the signals that we hear uh, in yes. the tickets. Yes. So to, we can transform those to some courses, to some videos, yeah. YouTube channel, in-product guides, these kind of things. Yeah. So great segue, because that's actually our next uh, topic. So I'll move us to that. Um, at first, I'm going to answer a question. So Lance, yes, the recording will be available after. And I just want to, I have to say this, guys, but this this logo that's up here, this is my noise cancellation software. So I'm actually in a very echoey room, but the, the software is, is canceling that. But I couldn't get rid of the logo. So <laughs> apologize for the distraction of this logo. Um, but it will help create a better audio track on the recording. So if you want to listen to this afterwards, you please do, and we'll make it available on the Natomi website. Okay, so Oleg, you just brought up collaboration, topic of collaboration. It was the, the third topic that you and I said that we would talk about. So I love your phrase. You want to repeat the, the phrase you told me about the best support is? Yeah, best support is no support. Yeah, yeah. Do you know where that, who, who came up with that? I mean, surely it wasn't, uh, it wasn't either I, of us. I, I, yeah, I was actually hearing this from um, the one of the candidates uh, for the support team back in the mm -hmm. day. And 
I think this was uh, sort of like really short and great uh, mm -hmm. highlight of like the overall philosophy that uh, I was yeah. thinking about. Because ultimately, if you uh, think about any digital pro uh, product, uh, and let's imagine that uh, I don't know, you have your calendar or like uh, time up uh, on your uh, on your phone. I barely imagine that you're, you know, just contacting support because something wrong with, with this product. So usually uh, such, such simple products, they work like Swiss knife and uh, everything is fine. Um, and uh, this is sort of like an unreachable ideal that you need to strive for. And of course, with such complex products like uh, Mirror, uh, it's, it's barely imaginable when people would uh, understand the whole concept right away, uh, will not, uh, I don't know, face some bugs and these kind of things. But this is just at least uh, ideology that you, you can uh, have in place because ultimately uh, the biggest value that you can do uh, for the company uh, uh, as a support team is actually converting those insights, these like the most honest feedback that you hear in the ticket threads to the product insights. Because ultimately, if you don't do this, you will get more tickets, uh, you yeah. will get higher costs, you will have pissed off yeah. customers. And uh, eventually any customer support interaction is uh, the destruction for the user. Mm -hmm. So as a support team, our goal is to ensure that we uh, reduce it to the minimum uh, amount as, as, as soon as possible. Yeah. So I've, I've just been reflecting on some of my own experience and I, I've been in companies where product was receptive to a lot of this input from, you know, this distilling out of insights from the tickets. And I've been in companies where, <laughs> where the product managers are receptive and I've, I've, and I've been in companies where they were shields up and, um, it, it was sometimes hard because I was in, in this case, I was in a go-to-market capacity. It was sometimes hard to get the product managers to take these insights seriously because they kind of sometimes go into the like, well, that's just a big whiner. You know, that customer is just a big whiner. I mean, of course, they all they have to do is click here and they can do that thing. But, and they sort of got, it fell in love with their own product. And so there was a lot of resistance. So how's it been for you in terms of as you distill these insights, you know, feeding them into the appropriate parts of the organization. How's it been for you? How have you overcome any resistance you might have, or how did you foster receptivity? Yeah. Like, I'm just leaving that open for you. How's that been? Um, first of all, I think I need to mention that uh, this this is an ongoing process. And the, the challenge that we have is that uh, we, we had several iterations doing this product feedback loop. Uh, but we were just because of the fact that we were growing so fast, we uh, are forced to, you know, rebuild the process on the go. Imagine that you you need to uh, you would like to have a car, but you have only half ready, and on the go you need to rebuild it, like some some specific parts. So what's the problem with that? <laughs> um, I would say I, that I'm, like I'm teasing totally. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean, like, but. I'm just like, imagine once again, the amount of connections that you have. One thing like uh, when you are doing it for 200 people organization, another when you have like 1000 people and you are going to scale even further. Yeah. And so like, this is not an end and this is going to be uh, continued. And so, um, but first of all, when I was thinking about like how I can uh, build the relationships with uh, the product teams, I was thinking like, okay, Let's imagine I'm the product manager. So I, I always try to, you know, empathize to, sure. to the product yeah. managers. And yeah. so I was thinking like, okay, someone is just knocking my door. Like, why the hell should I listen to this person? <laughs> and so what I've started uh, with, uh, I just first tried to get the buy-in uh, from the product leaders about very certain and specific things. For instance, uh, I even had a, uh, a chance to talk to our CEO who is very deep into the product development still. So he is really like, uh, I would say one of the strongest product champions uh, in the company, even though like we're a thousand uh, people company. Uh, but back in the day, I had an opportunity to talk to him and just ask simple questions like, okay, from the product perspective, uh, how we can define that this amount of tickets is enough to say that, 
okay, this is a problem, we need to fix yeah. this. Or, yeah. or should we align this only to specific OKRs? Or maybe yeah. we need to think about it holistically and uh, combine it together with the deal blockers from the sales guys. Yeah. Maybe yeah. we need to also think about like the cases when this the same problem was uh, not only causing, let's say, 500 tickets for this given month, but also uh, we lost this amount of money because uh, people yeah. were facing these problems uh, and this amount of people churned because you know we, yeah. we wouldn't be able to retain those. Yeah, and so I love this because what you're talking about is how to make the case to product that a certain thing is worthy of getting engineering resources. And you're talking about really kind of having empathy for what it's like to be in their shoes and what they care about. And I, I'm gonna speak what I think most people on this call know, that product managers, they, they fall in love with their own product features. I mean, I've been there, so I've been one of these people. And they the, the features and capabilities really always loom so much larger. And so, it's almost like you have to be twice as convincing coming from the, the support side um, because you're always, it's, I, I hate to use this because it's such a charged term, but like there's a bias almost, there's a bias towards product features and capabilities and their strategy and their roadmap. And then here you come with this, really this unsexy requests of like, hey, this screen doesn't work well, or, you know, whatever the, this flow doesn't work very well, even though I know it's not a revenue generating flow, it isn't. It's one that affects our churn, so we better, you know, we better fix it. So, you, my experience, you, it's almost like the support people have to be twice as good. And I remember the the best collaboration I had with product from a from a, or sorry, from product because I was in product with customer service was when the the woman who ran the whole team, she really cultivated a relationship with all of us product managers, and um, she really we trusted her. And, and she was being smart about it because then when she came and said, hey, these things are getting in our way, we were responsive to her. So I, I guess what I'd say is anybody, you know, anybody out there in our audience here, like the more you can be buddies with your product managers to develop that relationship in advance, um, spend time with them. Uh, I think it's going to pay off. And um, oh, like I imagine you, you know, having good relationships with the product people. Uh, or any sure. other other systems people that own like Salesforce or any whatever CRM you guys are using, um, it's really important. Yeah, and I would say that uh, when I was exploring uh, how other companies are doing the the same thing, I even heard the story when uh, at some company uh, the head of engineering had such a great relationship with uh, the head of support that yeah. he didn't care about the numbers. He was yeah. just going to the head of support and asking her like give me a top five pain points for yeah. the support yeah. and immediately got to the backlog and that's it. So uh, I definitely believe that the relationship is key. And, uh, but when you are scaling this, this getting more and more complex, because for instance, if you imagine the product management function in uh, let's say Facebook, uh, they have product managers who would be responsible for, you know, one tiny button mm -hmm. or like mm -hmm. a set of buttons. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you scale, you need to, you know, clearly understand with whom you need to build those relationships yeah. and uh the the best way is uh like from my experience is to start the conversation not with complaining about the product but asking like okay how i can help you how uh, how the insights that we hear from the uh, support uh, views how they can inspire you to improve the product yeah. and um on top of that i think what what was helpful at least uh at uh, in our case at Mirror, is the fact that we have really strong uh, customer-centric culture because one yeah. of the key metri metrics that we use in the company is a uh, North Star metric. Uh, and this is basically like the value metric. And even if you go to the hackathon, uh, all the answers will be like, okay, this is the idea that will impact uh, North Star metric in this uh, way. And for those who are not familiar with the concept, this is the uh, ultimate guidance star metric that you can use uh, in any business. For instance, for Airbnb, it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the number of uh, booked nights. And the idea behind is that as long as you grow this number, your revenue will grow, but this will be also an indicator that uh, your users get in the value because otherwise, yeah. why should they you know, book the yeah. nights there? 
And the yeah, same for okay. us because we were uh, uh, trying to digest how many active collaboration sessions are happening in the product. And all the, all the efforts in any part of the organization, uh, they are ultimately going towards this North Star metric. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and we talked about this a little bit that for you guys, even though you're in the sales organization, I think what you told me, one of the primary metrics you're still using is CSAT. And it's it's an ongoing process or it's more of a maybe a, a on deck next stage to start to tie in your efforts more towards those those top end metrics, I think is what you talked about. And uh, do, do I have it right so far? I don't want to mischaracterize yeah. that. Yeah. So I guess what I would bouncing off of that for our audience, you know, CSAT was the one that Oleg uses primarily now. And um and I think everybody on the call gets that and probably focuses on it too. But the more you can tie your efforts into the actual revenue, and um, the, I've found you, it's so much easier to get those projects funded or, or, or prioritized rather um, within when when you start to get everybody to believe that doing you know task X here affects the revenue number here, and the one I think most success most support organizations have used is churn because it's hard to do revenue that's so focused on you know how you sell and the strategy and the value of the product but churn is that one and so i i recommend you know to anybody in the audience if you haven't tied into your churn number if you've got kind of a a SaaS model for your company then um you need to and it'll become much easier to, to do that advocacy that that oleg you've been talking about i think for, for when you tie into churn numbers and, and more of those top line metrics. I think what, what was helpful here, apart from uh, trying to connect these to uh, some straightforward metrics like mm -hmm. uh, churn, for instance, I think what, what is helpful is trying to see like the whole picture. Because for instance, uh, one thing is uh, the customer related metrics, for instance, uh, how many tickets we received uh, for this specific problem. And uh, usually like at least uh, the benchmark across the market is that like the tickets that you see uh, in, in the support, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Usually you need to uh, multiply this by at least 50 or 60. And this is how you can get the, like the, the real problem. And uh, yeah. you, you, you can imagine like how, how much struggle you have for for the users because only engaged ones will eventually uh send you the message but uh apart from that i think what 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 is helpful to uh, make sure is that if you don't address this then you need to somehow cover this with people so right. as as an organization you need to just make a choice either you invest this in the product or you're okay with having a buggy product and but over in people, which also yeah. costly. So yeah, I love that. I love that distinction. It's like invest now on the technology or you know, start staffing up, which has its inherent challenges. Okay, let's answer some questions. Um somebody said, uh, do you have a favorite CS book? Uh, I have it, but it's in Russian, so I don't think it's valuable <laughs> for this call. Um so yeah, I, I, I'm not sure if I can be helpful over here. Yeah. Well, you and I, we actually have picked up the same book because you told me about Making of the Manager was was one that yes. you liked, even though it's not purely. So Making of the Manager was one that you really liked. Um, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed uh, reading this. And yeah. uh, I think the, the biggest value that um, you can get from this book is when you are just a new manager because uh, this lady explains her own path in a very you know, uh, sincere and uh, yeah. uh, natural way. And uh, she's explaining things like when uh, she didn't know what she's talking about and, you know, her direct reports busted here on this and like how she handled all of these uh, situations and then what she learned. Uh, and eventually she's uh, giving you really straightforward playbooks and frameworks mm -hmm. to, okay. you know, not, not, not doing the same uh, mistakes as she did. So I really enjoyed the book. Okay, like that. Um, I've got a question here from Adam. He says, curious if you were using any other tools aside from help centers to drive self-service support success. Um, I would say that uh, like when we are talking about this uh, best support is no support model, mm -hmm. I yeah. think uh, like 
when you're talking about this product feedback loop, uh, you always will have the situation where you got the buy-in from the product manager, but he or she will say like, okay, we will do this like in two years. So, or in two quarters, this kind of thing. So you, you still need to somehow address the pain point that you see in, in the support tickets. And this is completely fine. And uh, the next step when we're talking about delivering the value to, to, the, uh, uh, to the company is mm -hmm. actually proactively sharing the best practices with the, with the users. And the most straightforward way for this will be uh, the help center. Uh, but apart from that, you can also uh, have different channels to uh, spread the voice of support across uh, different uh, parts of the assets. For instance, uh, what we recently did, we uh, implemented uh, several uh, proactive emails for the enterprise user, users, uh, sharing like, hey, here are top five tips for setting up SSO, because we knew that SSO is a pain because it's like uh, qu quite a hard process to do. Or for instance, uh, inside of the marketing emails, we were including the links to the uh, help center articles because we knew that this is the trending uh, yeah. thing. Or we also try to do, let's say in the online community, we try to do uh, like top five su uh, suggestions by the support in a month yeah. or the same within the product. So you, you, like the goal here is just to reach to any part of the organization and any part of the visible- Maybe the touch uh, points, yeah. Yes, yeah, yes. Totally, okay. Um, I'm, I, I wanna finish this up here with these last two questions. So. You, believe it or not, everybody, you, Oleg, you and I did, we haven't talked about AI at all, even though Natomi is an AI company and we want everybody to use AI. But so we're going to, we'll ask you cold here. And I'm just reading the question from Anonymous. Uh, what is Oleg's forecast on using AI and customer service to scale? Uh, from my perspective, at least what I've been uh, looking at, looks like the AI industry is sort of like, in the beginning of being trendy, uh, and uh, I'm 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 really curious to see what we can uh, get to in a couple of years because uh, ultimately I don't think that AI will I don't know kill the uh, people who are working in the industry. I think what would like the biggest value uh, that people can get from the AI is actually. Uh, making sure that the simplest things they're answered by machine uh, yeah. and the most complicated the most interesting cases they're handled by the people because ultimately uh, i think the the future is about the uh, being like sort of in the hybrid in the collaboration yeah. Yeah. Uh, when when uh, people can really uh, talk to other people about very complex things and so i, I really yeah. believe that people will always would love to talk to real people when you know discussing certain things and yeah. uh, so, let yeah. me comment on that I'll, I'll, i just want to comment on that and you were so right because it's like you know the i think some folks in the customer service industry initially they think uh oh is is my is my customer now going to just have to talk to a bot and it's going to be a bad experience and what actually happens is as you said the people that do need to talk to somebody because of the nature of their problem, now they're getting, they have, there's more bandwidth to service those people because your people, your agents are not bogged down with the same old question time. And that's, that's where we're seeing the magic. It, it doesn't reduce the need for agents. It allows you to direct your agents surgically exactly where it's needed. And what we found is that the agents are a lot happier because it's not, they don't come into work and answer the same question 4,000 times, yeah. which is not very rewarding, as you know, and everybody on this call knows. Okay. Yeah, sure. um, what is What are the three ingredients of a great CS experience? Um, what do you I, I would start with people. I mean, like, I really hate when uh, people who think that they uh, uh, they are good at customer service uh, for some reason. They actually are not that good. They are, for some reason, you know, start working there and eventually you, you get poor experience. And so I think uh, the first and foremost thing you need to do is hire really great people. And for this, I prefer to have the combination of people with uh, strong empathy and problem solving mm -hmm. skills. Mm -hmm. So they yeah. need to have like healthy balance here. The second thing uh, I would say is like uh, the right culture because you need to build the environment where uh, these people will be treated well 
And so you need to take care of uh, those people because I strongly believe that happy support means happy customer. You, you yeah. can't really make happy anyone else if you are unhappy yourself. Yeah. Um, so and and this co- can go like within the team management with cross function collaboration and these kind of things. And okay. the last piece that I've learned hard way is think about operations. Think about uh, like if if I had a time machine and I had an opportunity to uh, go back in like three years ago when I just started at Mira, the first thing I would do is actually setting up the right uh, tagging system in place, yeah. uh, understanding where the tickets come from, understanding the trends, and while the company is small, building this product feedback loop uh, right away. So this yes. would be like my, my top priority. So feedback loop, three, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, those three, I, I think they're the most important. Yeah. Okay. All right. Oh, look, I'm just going to do one final call for questions. And going once, going twice. Okay, everybody, I, I don't want to take us over the hour. I do. So, oh, look, actually, before I show that, oh, look, thank you, my friend. This was great. I'm really grateful for your uh, willingness to sit with us and talk about interesting topics. I hope the audience got a lot out of it. Um, so, again, thank you, my friend. Thank you as well. Yeah. And then for the audience, I've got just one last slide to show. So this is our next webinar, uh, which you can see is out in November. And really excited to have the CEO of Gainsight. So Nick's gonna, going to get on with me and uh, we'll go deep into where he sees the, this topic of CX going. And, and you know, from his position, he's got a very strategic view as it relates to his company and the industry. So it should be a very uh, fun conversation. All right, Oleg, let's sign off. Thank you very much again. And thank you to the audience for hanging in there with us. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye.